So uh, Kyle is a mycoagriculturalist, which I was excited to see that term because I would consider myself sort of in that camp as well, specifically with um, mycorrhizal fungi and agroecology. But one of the things that's really exciting about Kyle is that he's bringing a lot of different lenses to the table. So he's had time studying in academia and doing some research. Um, he spent uh, a good chunk of time diving deep into mycology as well, and then really has lived that out in the Pacific Northwest since he moved there, um, including that he's uh, bringing in a lot of these um, fungal solutions to, specifically to cannabis farming in the uh, Pacific Northwest with his company. And then also, in addition to being trained here at the Soul Food Web School, uh, you may have read in his bio that he has some uh, some other certifications more maybe in the we could call them the industrial agriculture setting. So it's exciting that he can compare and contrast some of these different um, paradigms or, or ideas. And I guess I have to talk about myself as well here. I uh, I've been at the school over a year you've seen me on some other webinars probably or, or maybe read some blogs where I typically um, have a lot to say about fungi and how much I love them but I do content creation and science communication generally across the organization working um, in the FCs and in some of our advanced programs to find you know to, to bring science to the table so that we're always on the cutting edge and uh, I, like I said, I studied uh, mycorrhizal fungi in um, grad school and did research uh, into the integration of mycorrhizal fungi with crops. So anytime Kyle and I get together, we um, have a lot to talk about and to be nerds together about fungi. And I think that that brings us right to where I'm going to let Kyle take it away and, um, and, and give us his presentation. Great, yeah, thanks for the introduction there, Adam. That, that was great. <clears throat> so my talk today is titled Farming with Fungi. And really, I, I called it an exploration into applied soil mycology. So mycology, I would say, is kind of a buzzword right now. It's very popular um, within the sciences, but also just in mainstream media. There are a bunch of articles from New York Times, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, and, and all these different um, resources that, that are talking about fungi and the importance of these organisms. So th I, I, I think that's a good thing overall, that, that people are becoming more aware of mushrooms and fungi and some of the benefits that they can confer to us as humans. So mycology is going to be the field studying fungi, which includes mushrooms, molds, yeasts. Those are all fungi. Typically, when people hear the word mycology, the first thing they think about is mushrooms. And that's be for good reason, too, I suppose. They're very charismatic. They look cool. They're, they're weird. And that's really, in my experience, and for me in particular, what drew me to the field of mycology. And then I learned that there's all these different ways that we interact with fungi on a daily basis. So uh, <laughs> the image here is of leaf cutter ants. So these ants in particular, they have been growing and farming fungi and even some mushrooms for millions of years. So here's a perfect example of an organism that partnered with fungi, that learned to work with fungi to help both organisms succeed and increase their fitness overall in that environment. So um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I get too far into it, I would just like to thank the Soil Food Web for inviting me to have this presentation here today and to talk about farming and fungi and how the two relate. So yeah, I, I'm very grateful for them. Uh, also, Dr. Elaine Ingham. So the, she's started the Soil Food Web School. And I think she's been a great advocate for soil biology. She was really one of the pioneers in the Soil Food Web School of Thought. 
Um, so I am very grateful for her just to bring this information um, and make it more accessible to people everywhere. Um, so I went to graduate school in Wisconsin, where I studied with the professor, Dr. Tom Volk. Um, he was a great man, and he actually um, moved on. He, he passed away two days ago. So maybe we could just take a few moments just in remembrance for Tom. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Tom, Tom, he was a great man. He means a lot to me. I love him. I always will love him. And um, yeah, very grateful for him and all that he has done for the field of mycology. But with that being said, uh, the show must go on and, and let's move along. So a little bit more about me. Uh, I, I won't talk about me too much. I went to my undergraduate to study plant biology with a minor in chemistry, then went to do my graduate work in Wisconsin with Dr. Tom Volk, where my thesis was um, finding alternative and sustainable substrates to cultivate oyster mushrooms on. So I would be happy to, to share that work or discuss it in greater detail uh, if anyone is interested. But after graduating school, I moved out to the Pacific Northwest, as Adam mentioned. And then I, I started working for several different fertilizer companies, which was not where I thought I would end up when I was going to school to study plants and fungi, but that's where my journey took me. And I'm gr very grateful for the experience. It, I, I definitely learned a lot about the fertilizer industry and got to work hand in hand with a number of farms. And during that time, I also became certified through the American Society of Agronomy as a certified crop advisor. So that means that I, I work with a number of fungi doing, or a number of farmers, excuse me, doing soil tests, also doing tissue tests, looking at plants and trying to figure out how we can increase the productivity of these different farming systems. And ideally, how we can do that in a more sustainable way by partnering with some of this biology that we'll be talking about today. So I also uh, became certified with the Soil Food Web School to use the microscope to assess and quantify biology in soils and compost, which ultimately is what led me here today. So um, for our talk today, I'll begin with just discussing what fungi are. So the kingdom fungi is extremely diverse. There are a number of different fungal organisms, fungal species, and there's a wide variety in the different roles that they play in different environments and different ecosystems. So after we define what fungi are and also what they are not, um, then we'll go into some of the ecological roles, where these fungi are found, um, what they are doing in different environments. And then we'll kind of narrow in and focus on um, what different fungi are doing in soils and on plants and in particular, how we can use them in regenerative, sustainable agriculture. So we'll go into how we can work with these organisms, and then we'll talk about where I see this heading in the future, where I think um, farming will go in the future, in particular regenerative farming, and how fungi can be incorporated into that system in the future. So to begin with, we'll talk about what are fungi. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms, um, which is important. The main, main things there being that they have a true nucleus, they have a number of membrane-bound organelles, and the, the interior of a cell is somewhat similar to plants and animals. Um, however, uh, if we could go to the next slide, um, fungi are not plants. Fungi are not animals, they belong in their own kingdom. So all three of these organisms being fungi, plants, and animals, they are all in the domain eukaryo. 
you're eukaryote, meaning that they all share certain traits. So they all are eukaryotic, meaning that they have these um, true nuclei, they have membrane-bound organelles, and they share some other features as well. However, this is a Venn diagram here, just um, showing, show, if we go back a little bit, yeah, just showing uh, some of the similarities and differences. However, we had to do a last minute background change. So the, the, the Venn part of the diagram isn't really popping, but <laughs> I'll, I'll just try to do my best to describe it. Traditionally, fungi have been studied with plants, and they once were thought of as plants due to their morphological similarities. Both of these organisms are sessile, meaning that they don't move, right? So that's something that plant, uh, plants and fungi share, but is very different from animals. Animals are mobile. They are able to move. And evolutionarily, that is very important. Being mobile, they're able to run or hide or move away from predators or harm. Plants and fungi are not able to do that. So they have evolved other means of protecting themselves, such as, um, you know, uh, producing secondary metabolites that, that may deter herbivores or predators from eating the particular organism. Some of it could be just structures that they have on the outside of their body to protect themselves either from the environment or from other organisms. Um, so again, going back to the similarities between plants and fungi, because remember, they are similar. They used to be studied together and they both have cell walls, which is part of what makes them rigid and uh, unable to move. So both organisms, plants and fungi, have a cell wall, and they serve the same function. However, the composition of the cell walls of plants and fungi is very different. So chit uh, the fungi have a cell wall made of chitin, versus plants have a cell wall made primarily of cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin. So um, they're, they're very different structurally. And we can use this to our benefit, especially when the fungi are growing on plants and in particular our cash crop, and we don't want those fungi growing there. So knowing the differences between plants and fungi can help optimize our chances of success for reducing pathogen load or plant disease. As I mentioned previously though, Fungi are actually closer related to animals than they are to plants. So superficially, they can look like plants and seem like plants, but genetically, ultimately, they're closer to animals than they are to plants. So both animals and fungi belong to the clade Epistacanta. Again, I won't go too deep into this, but the reason being that certain fungi and animals, they have a stage of their life where they have a mobile gamete or a mobile cell. Um, and that is part of the reason that scientists have found that fungi are actually closer related to animals than they are to plants. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, we can see examples of different types of fungi. So mushrooms are fungi. I'll go into this more. All mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi produce mushrooms. So mushrooms are the reproductive structure that certain fungi produce, but not all fungi. Um, another good example of a fungus is a yeast. A yeast is a broad general term just for a single celled fungus. So they look very different from other types of fungi, which display more of a filamentous growth pattern. And we also see molds, a lot of food contaminants. Those will be fungi as well that are opportunists and that are able to grow on um, these nutrient mediums. Um, so uh, when we think of animals, I want to touch on this really quickly. Uh, obviously, we as humans, we are animals, but so is an earthworm. An earthworm is also an animal, belongs in the kingdom Animalia. Uh, Insects as well, they are fall under the same kingdom of animalia. So yeah, I just want to make that clear that when we are thinking about 
the closeness and the similarities or differences between fungi and animals, it's not just us humans or even mammals. Um, there are lots of different types of animals. So um, we'll kind of move on. And we briefly talked about how there are these mushrooms that certain fungi form, but there's also different types of just generic, we call them mold fungi. Um, and those are going to be filamentous types of fungi. So what we see on the left here is more of the yeast type morphology, where it's just a single celled fungus that is able to reproduce asexually just by budding off and creating a genetically identical daughter cell. So, so that is very advantageous to yeast fungi because they are able to replicate very quickly and colonize a territory to try to get all of the resources and nutrients that it can. Alternatively, there are certain fungi I, um, that are going to grow in more of a filamentous pattern that we see on the right here. So the, a fungal filament that is going to be termed a hypha, hypha is a singular term, hyphae would be plural if we we're talking about multiple filaments. And then if we're talking about a group of filaments or a group of hyphae, that is termed mycelium. Um, within the, the filamentous structure, what we notice is that some of these filaments will have these little cross wall or sections that, that are termed septa. So septa of, are a feature of certain types of fungi and can also be used as an identification feature. However, not all fungi produce septa, not all filaments produce these septum. So, um, however, we cannot use this solely as a feature to classify organisms are good or bad in the soil. So just because an organism produces septa does not mean that it is a necessarily a beneficial good organism. The converse is also true. So if a fungus does not have septa, that does not make it ultimately a bad and harmful fungus. Uh, for instance, uh, as I'm sure Adam knows quite well, our muscular mycorrhizal or endomycorrhizae, they do not form septa. So they have this aseptate, or another term for that is cyanocytic uh, filaments. So there are no cross walls in the filaments of mycorrhizal fungi, or at least very few if they are present. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on that. The two main types of fungal morphologies that we'll see in nature are yeasts and these filaments. Certain fungi are called dimorphic and they can actually grow in a yeast phase. And then if the environment's right, they'll grow in a filament phase. So it's important to remember pretty much everything I'm saying here today. I'm trying to describe it the best we can. But fungi don't always read the book, as, as Tom used to say, quite often. And we like, as scientists, to kind of categorize these things and to put them in nice little neat boxes. But that doesn't always work out. And it's kind of on a spectrum. And yeah, certain fungi definitely display this when they are growing in both a yeast and a filamentous form. So... For the remainder of this talk, I suppose I'm going to be focusing primarily on filamentous fungi. However, that does not mean that yeasts are not important. I think yeasts are incredibly important and probably vastly misunderstood and understudied. Um, I think that yeasts are probably more ubiquitous than we can than we know and realize. The the most important or Yeast for us as humans historically has been Saccharomyces cerevisiae that's used in brewing and also baking bread. I think that yeast can be more difficult to recognize and see in soil environments. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why they're not quite as often studied. But I think as our techniques and approaches for measuring and looking for different yeasts get better, and more sophisticated over time, we'll begin to realize um, 
some of the other ecological roles that yeast play that we don't necessarily realize today. But moving on, I'm going to be focusing primarily on filamentous fungi today. So I wanted to go through a few examples just of what fungi are versus organisms maybe that are commonly thought of as fungi, but they're not true fungi. The first image I have here is of a mushroom. This is, I, I would say this is probably the most famous mushroom in the world, really. It's called Ammonita muscaria, and it is an ectomycorrhizal fungus. So we haven't really talked about fungi and the different sorts of habitats that they live in yet, but know that mycorrhizae is a type of association that fungi and plants form together where the plant where the roots of certain plants will directly interact with the filaments of certain fungi and the the fungus the filaments will um infect the root and grow into the root and they will have this partnership where both members are benefiting we'll go into this a little bit more later but know that again i i say this quite a bit so all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi produce mushrooms. So moving on, the next um, picture here, we see this filamentous-like organism that's growing. It's, it's quite beautiful. Um, and it's just growing on two dimensions there. So we can see it kind of branching out. And what we can notice is that it, the the organism is branching out in search of food. So we see these grains, these rolled oats here, and on the bottom left and top right of the picture, um, and that's the food source that this organism is looking for. However, I know that superficially this kind of looks like a fungus, but this is not a fungus. This um, is so if you could click uh, slide this is not a fungus this is actually a slime mold that is uh actually an amoeba an amoeba zone is the grouping that it is currently in again traditionally thought of as fungi and because it's called a slime mold it's kind of confusing and i could see how people would think that it is a fungus but slime molds are not true fungi they're still important for agriculture and in ecosystems. Uh, they are important, but they're not true fungi. So um, going on, another fungus, the uh, fungi, a lot of fungi can be pathogenic on certain plant species. So here we see a, a leaf surface and the top surface there is covered with a fungal disease called powdery mildew. Powdery mildews are quite ubiquitous in nature. They grow on a wide variety of plants. And this is a true fungus. So powdery mildews are, is a huge group of a number of different species of fungi. And one of the important facts about powdery mildews that I want to mention here is that they are fairly host specific. So that's important when we are farming or gardening or whatever. And if, if we have our cash crop and then on the borders, maybe we have trees. And on these trees, if we are to see powdery mildew, well, the powdery mildew that is on those trees is likely not going to be able to infect your cash crop, depending on what your crop is. So the, these powdery mildew species are fairly host specific meaning that they can't jump from, say, squash to corn, um, because those are very different plants and they're very different hosts. So it will actually be different species of powdery mildew that are infecting each of those hosts separately. So it's common for me to be working with farmers that will see powdery mildew growing on neighboring plants and will begin to preemptively treat their crop so that with the fungicide in hopes of preventing fungal growth. I understand why they're doing this, and it can make sense because it could just be an indicator that the environment is conducive to this fungal growth. But the chance of 
uh, a powdery mildew species that is infecting a weed to also infect the, the crop that you're growing is fairly small. So, but it's again, it is still a good in indicator that the environment may be conducive to uh, powdery mildew growth. So uh, again, on this, we see on the top side of the leaf, we'll see um, little fuzzy mycelium, white mycelium beginning to grow. It kind of looks powdery, hence the name powdery mildew. This is a true fungus. But next, we have another leaf sample. So th this leaf is, <clears throat> is also showing disease symptoms. However, we do not notice the um, powdery white mycelium growing on the top surface of this leaf. We notice these chlorotic lesions that are beginning to form where, uh, you know, the, the leaf just is not as green. It's beginning to yellow out. Clearly, there is something going on. If we are to flip that leaf over, we might see lesions popping out on the underside of this leaf. So this is going to be a disease called downy mildew. Downy mildew is also not a true fungus. So again, it can be confusing. We have powdery mildew, which is a true fungus and a plant pathogen. And then we have downy mildews, which are plant pathogens, but they're actually water molds. They're not true fungi. Again, the common names can kind of get confusing where we have slime molds, we have water molds, and then we have just molds, molds. Um, so slime molds and water molds, those are not going to be true fungi. Downy mildew is an oomycete, <laughs> which uh, means something different in the soil food web school versus uh, in the scientific community. So in the scientific community, oh, my seat means water molds. Water molds are not true fungi. So thus far, we, we have seen different types of filamentous organisms, some of which were fungi, some of which were not fungi. However, we, we also discussed how yeast is a, a yeast cell is another type of morphology that fungi can produce. So if we go to the next slide, we are able to see a, an SEM image, so a scanning electron micrograph image of budding yeast cells. So this is a true fungus. Again, a yeast is just a general term for a single-celled fungus. Um, yeast are so successful in such a wide variety of environments because, again, they're able to bud off and reproduce asexually, essentially clones of themselves. So in the bottom left of the picture, you can kind of see some, some scars or some things that are kind of more tan in color. And those are going to be places in which that yeast cell has already budded off and created a, a daughter cell. This, this image is taken microscopically. So remember, there is a scale there. And the color was added back in just for uh, aesthetic enhan enhancement. So they look cooler to, to view. Um, so this is a yeast. This is a true fungus. But next we have another uh, SEM image that has had color added to it. We see, um, you know, structurally similar or similar structures here where they were both kind of like oval round shape, but these are actually going to be cocci bacteria. So spherical bacteria that superficially could resemble a yeast fungus but if we had a scale there, these organisms, bacteria, are much smaller in general than a yeast cell. So the size and the scale is going to be one of the things that will help you determine whether this is a fungus or a bacterium. So again, this SEM image, not a fungus. Okay.
And then this is uh, the last example that I'll go through, just of certain organisms that maybe superficially could resemble fungi or could confuse people. So the, um, all these images are, hopefully you can see them all right. They are going to be under 1,000x total magnification, so very magnified. And we see these clear uh, filaments growing in the field of view. And also, we typically, there are not going to be any sort of septum or septa or cross walls in these organisms. So they're going to be clear. They're growing filamentously, but they are not true fungi. They're going to be, again, the scale is important. They're going to be much smaller than typical fungal hypha. So all of these uh, images here are examples of filamentous bacteria. So not true fungi, but filamentous bacteria, which fall under the group actinobacteria or actinomycetes. Um, I, both terms I was kind of taught interchangeably. So, uh, but in general, what we are talking about here is a filamentous bacterium that is going to be much smaller in size than a typical fungus would be. They are clear, very few, if any, cross walls. Um, and ultimately, they inhabit different ecological niches typically than fungi would. So we can use all of these variables to help us determine what we are looking at and what sort of organisms we are facing. So actinobacteria, they're quite important in composting and even in soils in general, but they're not true fungi. So hopefully this um, gives you a better idea about what fungi are and also what they are not and some of the common confusions between fun fungi and fungal-like organisms. Um, I'm gonna get a drink of water here real quick. Excuse me. All right. So again, I'm going to focus mainly on filamentous fungi for the rest of this talk. Um, they, they're very important in all sorts of different environmental systems. But before we go into where they are found, I kind of want to talk about how they grow first. So we talked about what fungi are. Now let's talk about filamentous fungi and how they grow, because this is very important. And it's also very different than any other sort of organism. So if we could go on, I think this slide has some animations in it. So uh, the, the first image, yeah, the first image here, we can see a filamentous fungus growing. So on the lower right hand of this image, we see different little pieces of sawdust, and those were the inoculum in this case. So this filamentous fungus was growing on these little pieces of sawdust, and then once the fungus consumed all that food, then the fungus is like, all right, we need to send out more filaments to cover more surface area to try to find more nutrients and resources so that we can replicate and spread our genes elsewhere in the environment. From a biological perspective, that kind of is the fitness and um, I don't want to say the point of life, but I, it seems to be the ultimate goal of a number of biological organisms is to reproduce and have your offspring um, carry on your genetic material. So we have this filamentous fungus that is growing here in search for different nutrients and resources. So if we zoom in a little bit on the tip of that fungus, so on all these fungal filaments, they are all growing from this apical tip. The older part of the fungus does not grow, does not extend out back behind these cross walls. They're growing from this apical tip. So that's very unique. Um, at this apical tip, we have this, uh, it's not a true structure, but this area that we call the Spitzenkorper. Um, I had hoped to go into more detail about the Spitzenkorper, but I don't think uh, we'll, we'll have time for all of that today. But the important part is the, the Spitzenkorper, this apical tip of the fungus is where all the action is happening. That's where the fungus is growing from. And the Spitzenkorper is this area that's very dense of microtubules. So microtubules are acting almost as uh, like highways 
transporting these vesicles that are full of enzymes to this growing tip. And so the microtubules are going to carry these uh, enzyme-laden vesicles to the fungal tip. The fungus will then excrete that out of the growing tip right in front of the fungus. These enzymes will begin to break down complex organic molecules into their more simple uh, element parts that the fungus will then be able to absorb back into its body. So that's another key difference that's unique with fungi and different between humans or animals, we'll say, and fungi. So animals like us, we ingest our food, we eat it, and then we digest our food in our stomach. Fungi do the opposite. Fungi digest their food and then they ingest it. So as Tom used to say, this, this would be like going to a five-star restaurant, ordering a nice steak dinner. When your plate comes, instead of cutting it up with a fork and knife, you actually just vomit all over your food. And then you would stick out your hands and then absorb those nutrients. Uh, quite the image that he would paint there. But what I'm saying here is that the fungus is going to excrete these enzymes right out of its growing tip where it's going to break down these complex organic molecules. And then through the use of turgor pressure, once that substrate is softened, softened, the fungus will begin to grow through that substrate. So again, th this is pretty unique with fungi and the way that they grow and get nutrients. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention previously is plants being autotrophic. They can produce their own food. They, through photosynthesis, they can produce sugars, which then they can metabolize to create energy, or they can send out their root to attract other organisms to help them grow. Fungi and animals are not autotrophic. They are heterotrophic meaning that they must rely on their exterior environment or alternate ways of getting nutrients and resources into their body. So fungi do this by growing through substrates, releasing extracellular enzymes directly outside of this cell wall, directly outside of this apical tip, where those enzymes will break down uh, more complex molecules into their simpler forms, and then the fungus will assimilate that those nutrients back into its body, and then it can continue growing. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I have a video here, and this is showing how fungi grow. And in particular, we talked about how they're growing for the, on the, eight, uh, the, the apical tip of these filaments. And once they get those nutrients back into the body, then they can kind of shuttle that into uh, older parts of the fungal mycelium. I'm not sure if this video will play or not. Doesn't yeah, matter. Some, somehow it didn't come through, Kyle. Okay, bummer. I'll have to describe it. So it, it was just a video kind of a time lapse showing fungi that are growing just from that apical tip because I, I, I just want to impress upon you how important that growing tip is to filamentous fungi. Um, another thing that the video had shown was just this movement of things, uh, intracellular components, whether that be organelles or vesicles that are flowing in bi-directional. So the tip of the growing fungus is sending information and nutrients and resources back to the rest of the fungus. The older part of the fungus is sending different materials and information up to this growing apex. And um, the, the fungus is just able to communicate with itself through this vast mycelial network, which has great implications in forest and agroecology type scenarios. Um, so that leads us to different ecological niches that certain fungi can play. So um, I want to talk about some of the places that we can find fungi and just the different functions that, uh, that these fungi are playing in these various environments. 
Fungi are extremely ubiquitous. One of the reasons that they are so successful in nature, there are a number of reasons, but one of them is because they reproduce via spores. So these organisms just produce billions, if not more, uh, spores that then they will produce and hopefully they get caught in a wind current and then they get transferred to a different area where hopefully it will be a suitable environment where the spore lands and they'll be able to grow and reproduce and carry on its life cycle. So, oh, the color. Um, so one of the one of the places that we commonly find fungi is in soil systems. <laughs> uh, kind of ironically, they're found in almost all soil systems except soil systems that have undergone agriculture, conventional agriculture, for the past however many years. It is very common for me to sample soil from places that have been cultivating wheat or corn or soy traditionally with the use of conventional fertilizers and herbicides. And when I look at that soil under a microscope, it is almost completely dominated by bacteria and there are very few, if any, fungi present. So sometimes we just kind of get in our own way. Uh, fungi are also found in the air. So both spores and other propagules can be found in the air where they're traveling through wind currents. Um, they are also found in aquatic environments, both saltwater and freshwater. They could be doing a number of different roles there. I think uh, that's another aquatic mycology is an understudied field. And I think we'll just learn more and more at, as we begin to study these organisms. But some actually produce mushrooms underwater. Others are likely just uh, breaking down dead organic material. Some are acting as parasites or pathogens on amphibians, fish. Um, so we find them in soil, in the air, in the water. And we also find them all over the, uh, the surface of ourselves and inside of ourselves. So we have what's called a microbiome, which is a little more well-known. That refers to our microbial community inside and outside of us on our surface and on our skin. Well, there's also a mycobiome, meaning the, the community of, or the population of fungi that are growing in and on us. And what uh the these fungi are typically growing on us and they're not causing us any sort of issues however if there's some sort of imbalance in our ph maybe we took antibiotics and certain populations have died well that can lead to um certain fungi that normally are quite benign to grow exponentially where they can cause uh, health issues uh, a great example of that is a yeast infection also, athlete's foot is a fungus that grows in between our toes. Um, ringworm is another fungal parasite pathogen that grows uh, on and in humans. But more importantly, for, for more pertinent for this particular talk is the mycobiome of plants. And what we see is all over the surface of plants, everywhere we look, we find fungi. So there are a number of fungi growing on the above ground biomass of plants, obviously growing with the roots of plants, inside the roots, outside the roots, inside the leaves, outside the leaves, that are really doing all sorts of ecological roles. In general, there are three main lifestyles that fungi display in environments. Those are going to be saprophytic, mutualistic and parasitic or pathogens. So a saprophyte is just a term for an organism that is going to break down dead organic material. Um, a mutualist, there are a number of examples of mutualistic fungi that form uh, associations with the roots of certain plants. And then there are obviously pathogenic uh, fungi that are growing on a host and stealing nutrients or harming the host in some sort of way. So I just wanted to mention that some of these different roles that fungi play in all these different environments. And now we'll go into the roles that fungi play in soils. 
So I'll kind of try to be brief with this just in order to get to the rest of the material here today. So this is just a diagram of the soil food web, uh, the different roles that fungi, bacteria, mites, uh, nematodes can play. So in general, on the left here, we have our roots. Roots can be consumed by root eating nematodes. Um, and that, that, that is a bad thing, especially for a farmer or somebody who is trying to grow crops because once the nematodes eat the roots, then the roots are no longer able to acquire nutrients. However, there are also fungi that are termed mycorrhizae fungi that will infect the roots of various plants. A majority of plants we are finding have some sort of mycorrhizal association, but not all of them. I think that as we learn more and our tools become more and more sophisticated, we will learn that um, there are even more types of mycorrhizae than we currently know about. So uh, we have mycorrhizae fungi. We also have saprophytic fungi that are just breaking down organic material. Uh, I want to say here before we move on, as the fungi are breaking down organic material, as bacteria are breaking down organic material, that is release, releasing nutrients in a plant, plant available form. Then these higher trophic level organisms being insects, mites, nematodes, other protozoans, as they are consuming the bacteria and the fungi, they are excreting their waste in a form of plant available nutrients. So as this decomposition is happening, that is releasing nutrients. Then as these organisms are being consumed by higher trophic levels, the organisms themselves excrete waste products also in the form of plant available nutrients. So uh, it's good to have diversity in your soil. That's a reoccurring theme in biology, just that diversity is key. Hopefully we as humans can learn that lesson sooner rather than later. But uh, when we have a biologically diverse system, especially in the soil, it is just more resistant, more resilient and resistant to changes if, um, you know, um, a, a negative abiotic, if there's a drought that will take out a certain population of your biology. But if you have a diverse community there, hopefully uh, there'll be other organisms that are able to survive and persist and carry out similar functions. So um, another role that fungi play in soils is they can eat or consume uh, pathogenic nematodes. So root consuming, consuming nematodes, they can actually be consumed by fungi. So this group of fungi is called nematophagous fungi, meaning that they are nematode consuming. There are a number of different examples of this. Um, here we have two images taken by a soil food web consultant uh, named Nick from Humankind, Oregon. Here he was able to see this particular fungus that is producing these loops that trap nematodes. So again, this is a very cool phenomenon that is happening, and I would like to talk about it in more detail, but I think I'm just going to keep moving along. Just know that there are certain fungi that are found in soils, and that can be used as a biocontrol to decrease the chance of infection of pathogenic nematodes in on your roots. So the, evolutionarily, very cool. The mechanism of how they do this, also very cool, but um, we'll move along. So we talked about different roles that the fu fungi can play in soils. And now I briefly wanna cover different roles that they can play in plants. Um, one of the most well-known roles is mycorrhizal fungi. There can be endomycorrhizae, they can be ectomycorrhizae. There are also a number of other types of mycorrhizae. Those are just the two uh, most well-known, and I suppose maybe that's important for uh, regenerative agriculture at the moment. So there are also endophytic fungi. These are fungi that grow inside of the host tissue without doing the host any apparent harm. This is a very interesting group of fungi that we are really just 
beginning to discover in the past 10 years or so. And I think in the future, we'll just be able to learn more and more about these fungi. So here we have a diagram of a plant and in blue, is going to be uh, the bacterial species that the researchers found growing on all these different plant parts. And the red is going to be fungi that were found. So really the take home message here is that everywhere we looked or sampled the plants for fungi, we found them. Um, the, the last role that fungi can play in plants is as a plant pathogen. Um, as farmers, we typically think of pathogens as being bad because they are decreasing yields and profitability. However, they play an important role in other environments by weeding out weak and sick individuals. Um, again, so we will move on and discuss briefly a little more about fungal pathogens. So we have the mycorrhizae, we have endophytes, and we have fungal pathogens. So for a fun, for a path for a disease to manifest and to see disease symptoms, you kind of need all three parts of this disease triangle. So this is called the disease triangle. There, there, there are um, it's very common in peer-reviewed research to be talking about this, where at the top here we have the host plant. Then we have the particular pathogen on the bottom left. And on the bottom right, we have the environment. So what this triangle is showing is that we need all three pieces of this puzzle to be there in order for the disease to manifest itself and for us to see symptoms. So what I mean by that is it has to be the correct host and the correct pathogen and a conducive environment. If the host and the pathogen are there, but the environment is not conducive for fungal growth, we will not see the disease manifest itself. Um, I, I'd like to talk more about it, but I want to move along. Also, I want to say with fungal pathogens, when we apply fungicides, most fungicides are pretty general and broad spectrum, meaning that they will kill the pathogen, but they will also kill all the beneficial fungi as well. So that's something that I want to be aware of when we are using fungicides or trying to prevent fungal growth a lot of these compounds they're not just going to prevent the growth of the pathogen they're also going to harm those endophytic fungi and other beneficial soil fungi as well um, so use sparingly i suppose and that leads us into working with fungi so I, I want to spend the, the remainder of our time here talking about different ways that we can work with fungi, different ways that we can incorporate fungi and mushrooms into our growing systems. So again, hopefully by this point, we are able to realize that fungi are extremely diverse. They play a number of different roles in all these different environments. Um, but now I want to focus on the practical application, all right? So we have a little bit of theoretical information, knowledge about what these organisms do, who they are, what they do not do. Um, and now we can go into more of the hands-on application of it. So one of the first things that you can do when you are thinking about your fungi in your agricultural system is to measure the fungal biomass. So you, you want to know what you are starting with just in order to build a healthy, diverse soil biology system. So there are a number of ways that we can measure and monitor uh, the fungi that are in our soils or different systems. Um, I would say the uh, Solvita test is one of the common ways that I see people looking at soil biology. Ultimately, this is looking at soil respiration. So it's not very specific um, to just fungi, but is a good way of determining your soil biology for a relatively inexpensive cost. Um, another method that we have is just direct microscopy. So this is what the Soil Food Web School teaches and why I was so drawn to becoming certified is because they, the soil food web teaches us how to prepare a sample of soil or compost or any other input material and assess and quantify the biological community that is present. 
Um, so that is a way of assessing our, our fungi, our fungal communities as well. Then something that is a little bit newer is called the soil microbiome, soil microbiometer. Um, this, again, you take a sample of your soil and it's going to tell you your fungal to bacterial ratio. Um, then there are more sophisticated techniques such as PLFA, which stands for phospholis phospholipid fatty acid. Um, that is more commonly used in peer-reviewed research and journal articles, whereas these top three would not really be as accepted in peer-reviewed research. And then I suppose the most robust, sophisticated technique that we have at the moment is to use genetic material or molecular techniques to look at fungi. As we develop more and more techniques, they become more accessible, less expensive. But I just want to point out that each one of these methods of measuring our fungi and our fungal biomass has limitations. That does not mean that it is not important. It does not mean that it's unaccessible. It just means that nothing is giving us the full picture. So it's important for me just to be aware of the limitations of these different tests and be able to pick the most applicable test that is going to give us information that then in turn we can make man informed management decisions based on the information that we are getting. Um, so it's good to get a baseline of where your fungal biomass is at and then we as regenerative farm practitioners can work on increasing the amount of fungi that is present if that is what um, we want to do. So when it comes to working with fungi, there are a number of different ways to um, uh, apply and inoculate your soil or your plants with beneficial saprophytic fungi. So we, we can make compost teas or com yeah, compost teas and apply those directly to plants. We could also grow these different endophytic uh, fungal species in liquid culture and then spray that or apply that to your crops or your soils. Um, but an easy way to do that where you would not need a lot of equipment would just be to create a compost tea or a compost extract and then use that to inoculate your soils and fields. Um, another popular school of thought in the regenerative farming community is called KNF or Korean natural farming. And Korean natural farming makes use of something that is called IMO. IMO stands for indigenous microorganisms. And it's kind of, again, a broad umbrella term for a number of microorganisms that are found locally. But if you look up IMO and KNF, it'll teach you how you can collect fungi and then grow this up and use that to inoculate your land. Uh, another great way to work with fungi is just to companion plant mushroom producing fungi with your cash crop. So then you get two different crops. You get a crop of edible mushrooms and you also get your plant crop that you're trying to grow. So these are all fairly low tech ways of increasing the amount of fungi that are in your system. However, if you want to go deeper and just get more specific with the with the fungi that you are working with or want to grow them up and just want to have more versatility with the, how you work with fungi, you really need to create some sort of a laboratory situation. Now, if, if we move on, this does not always have to be very expensive and sophisticated. I think every place that I've lived for the past decade, I have had some sort of mycology lab. I started in my parents' bathroom. I had a lab that I would set up and take down every time I used it. So really, it does not have to be a lot of space, and hopefully it can grow with you. As you increase your skills, then you can reinvest and get more equipment. But to start with, um, you know, you could work just in an oven, you turn it on low temperature for a couple hours before you do your work, then turn it off. And there's not a lot of air currents when you're working in there. Alternatively, on the lower left here, 
We see something called a uh, still air box, which can be another easy way to, um, a low tech way to begin working with fungi because you have to be sterile. You have to be aseptic because uh, contaminants are so common in mycology and when working with fungi. So we just have to be careful to reduce that. And then we could see other laminar flow hoods or um, eventually, you know, a biosafety cabinet is a, a more robust way, uh, secure way of working with fungi and protecting the user from any sort of pathogen that may happen. Um, so once, if we have a laboratory set up, that really uh, increases the number of ways that we can work with fungi. Again, I want to impress upon you, it does not have to be super sophisticated. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money to begin doing some laboratory work, growing fungi on Petri dishes or other mediums. So here on the left, we can see this is uh, where we're culturing endophytes from cannabis leaves. This it's a pretty simple technique. There are a number of techniques that you can find on the internet for doing this, but you need to have the sterile lab environment in order to work with this. So here we are um, extracting and then isolating different endophytic fungi that we find in these plant leaves. And then we could grow them all up individually and begin to experiment applying them to plants and seeing if we notice any sort of beneficial crop response. When trying, we could also, if we have a laboratory set up, we can grow soil fungi. This is something that I have done a number of times. Up here in the upper right, we see an example of a cereal dilution where we will continue to dilute the soil until we have, and then apply these different dilutions directly to a petri dish in the hopes of on, on the lowest uh, dilution or the highest dilution, I suppose, where it has the most amount of water. We want to be able to plate that and have very few organisms growing. Because if we are to plate just the undiluted sample, what we will get is just a bunch of organisms growing right on top of each other, and we won't be able to isolate different organisms out very well. So moving along, uh, again, I'm running short on time here. Where I foresee the future of farming going is I think that we will begin to um, realize and explore these different associations and relationships that fungi have with plants and how we can use them to our benefit to grow healthier crops more sustainably and also grow more nutrient dense crops. So we want to grow healthier plants uh, that can then in turn feed and ideally improve the health of whoever is consuming it. So I foresee in the future um, there, we just learn more and more about endophytic fungi and how important those are in agricultural systems. Um, yeah, I, I believe that if we as regenerative farming practitioners are able to partner with fungi, opposed to trying to control them, we could really use them as an ally to, and I, I don't even think we understand like the implications of that totally and how much that really can help our ecosystems and also just our own internal bodies. So real briefly, what we talked about today, we talked about what fungi are. They're eukaryotic organisms that belong to their own kingdom. They're neither plants nor animals, but somewhere in between. They're closer related to animals than they are to plants. But again, fungi are not animals. They belong to their own kingdom. Within this kingdom, fungi typically are growing either in a yeast morphology or in a filamentous form. Occasionally, they'll be growing both. That's referred to as a dimorphic fungus. And I just want to create more awareness around fungi, that they're found everywhere. There is a huge diversity in the different types of fungi that we see. And diversity is important because it creates resilience in any sort of system. Easy ways to get more fungi into our systems are through using biocomplete compost, leaf mulch, um, soil samples from healthy soils. There's a healthy forest, old growth forest can be used as an inoculum to kind of help create, to help boost a lot of that biology that's in your system. And also, I hope imp I impress upon you that working with fungi is fun. I have a great time. I, I'm very grateful that I get to do this. Um, for a living. 
and uh, I, I just want to spread the awareness and hope that more people begin appreciating these organisms and working with them because that's how ultimately we learn more about them. So with that, I would like to thank again, Dr. Tom Volk, uh, Paul Stamets, both of those were huge mentors of mine that were great ambassadors for fungi and I am forever grateful for. So with that, I would like to thank Tom and Paul and thank all of you for listening to me here today. All right, that, that, that was all for the presentation. So now if there are any Oh, I accidentally muted you, I think, Kyle. I'm so sorry. You were about to say that we're done with the presentation for now. Okay. I That was a total accident. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. No worries. No worries. I, I was about to mute myself, so save me a step. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, i just um, going to get back to our share screen here in a minute. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of people just expressing gratitude to you, Kyle, in the chat, because I can finally see the chat. And, uh, and that's exciting that, um, that everybody is, is just getting amped up over, over fungi. Something I yeah. love to see. And there is a lot of information that I wanted to talk about that just due to time constraints, I, I didn't get to today. Um, on the thank you slide there, I had my email on the bottom. My email is just kyle at mycofight.com. If anyone has any questions or things they want to talk about, feel free to reach out to me directly or ask questions here. I'd be happy to answer some. Awesome. And we do have some preloaded audience questions as well. Just before we get to that, I wanted to mention um, this promotion that we have going on here at the Soil Food Web School through December the 4th where we have a couple of selected courses that are going to be 40 percent off so you may have heard about our foundation courses which are really um I, i'm guessing what 50 or 60 hours of content in there um where you get to hear from dr elaine about fungi about some of these other organisms that interact with fungi um, you learn a little bit about soil chemistry soil um, physical um, factors, but it's very focused on the soil biology and, and some case studies about um, the success in soil regeneration. So that's currently marked down um, as this sort of um, cyber sale that we're doing. Um, so uh, totally online at, at your own pace. Along with that, uh, there's there's a bundle, but there's also separately, I believe, the, the ability to purchase our introduction to permaculture course also at a discount right now. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody who's in the room know about that opportunity before we kind of dive into some some questions from the audience here. Um, David asks us, does mulching with wood chips affect the soil and how does it do so? So what have you found in terms of just putting raw wood chips on soil, Kyle? All right, there we go. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a great question. And so mulching with wood chips, I would consider, you know, just putting down on top of the soil. Uh, alternatively, there could be, you know, mixing uh, wood chips in with soil, which is a very different thing, right? So uh, historically, especially in the, the, the cannabis community, it was thought that if you're to add wood chips to your soil, that this is such a high carbon material that it's going to rob a lot of nitrogen away. However, I found that when mulching with wood chips, this does not occur because there's not that same competition uh, and offset between the carbon to nitrogen ratios. So, um, how does it affect the soil? It, it, it creates uh, more, it holds in more of the moisture content. Obviously, it depends on what environment you're in, but mulching in general can help just keep some of that water in the soil and prevent it from evaporating off. Um, it also can, the, your wood chips are likely to be an inoculum, whether you know it or not, for a number of biological organisms, in particular, filamentous saprophytic fungi. Um, so I, I think that 
my answer to most things probably is like, it depends, right? It depends on the situation, what you're doing, what kind of wood chips you are using, how you are applying them, what crop you're growing. Um, in general, though, I think that wood chips are good for enhancing the overall biological diversity. Um, what I like to do when working with wood chips in a, an agricultural setting is to first inoculate those wood chips with a saprophytic fungus and then uh, a mulch with those inoculated wood chips. <clears throat> this could be done with a, with a mushroom producing fun fungus. So there are a number of mushrooms that grow on wood chips. And then when you use those inoculated wood chips to grow, uh, to mulch your land, then you are also going to be ha having mushrooms that pop up as well. This is cool because mushrooms are cool, but more importantly, I think, is that these saprophytic fungi can really act as biological recruiters is what I call them. Where, yeah, you're increasing the, the amount of fungi because you're just inoculating your land with fungi, but that then is drawing in other creatures to the system. It's drawing in insects that want to eat this mycelium, which then have different bacterial communities with them. And then there's earthworms that come in and nematodes. So really, I think that mulching with inoculated wood chips is a great way to jumpstart your, your soil biology. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer, Kyle. And like, I've heard the same myth about wood chips when I was setting up a community garden, we got a bunch of free wood chips, and we were going to use them in all kinds of ways. And a lot of people said, Oh, no, well, it'll tie up all the nitrogen. I sort of wonder in a soil food web sense, if in some soils that lack the um, predatory organisms, that that might be more what people have seen that that the bacteria and fungi you know, like tie up a lot of nutrients and there's nothing eating them and reducing their populations or controlling them. Whereas if you have a healthy soil, uh, the complete soil food web, you know, it could be a little different, but then it, it also could just be a myth or it could be certain kinds of wood chips or it could be in certain climates that that sort of thing has happened before. So we definitely emphasize the use of a lot of woody materials in compost making. So, you know, the other side of the foundation courses besides learning the basics of soil is and and the organisms is the composting and and tea making process that um, Dr. Elaine has developed here and um, you know it's typically half or 60 percent of a thermophilic aerobic compost pile is going to be fairly high carbon nitrogen materials wood chips being you know a great example of that and Partially, as you've said, that's because we're trying to get those good fungal foods in there and encourage a lot of, of fungal organisms. So, well, I, I think you bring up a good point. And, you know, if we are to incorporate them into the soil, I do think it's going to tie up nitrogen because we're essentially composting in place, you know, yeah. when we're mixing these food sources together. So, but I, I, I don't see the same thing happening when I just mulch and cover yeah. with the public. Yeah, I think that that's key. I mean, there's a lot of people that after they get their soil um, back into a like, you know, a complete soil ecosystem going on, they find they, there's a lot of, um, I've, I've seen a lot of producers saying on a larger scale, some of the chop and drop techniques, where they're taking all kinds of materials and just putting that on the soil is a really great way to keep feeding that community to keep adding carbon to the system um, and, and wood chips to uh, can definitely work that way. Um, so this is a good question, and uh, I might uh, I might give the answer first since it's mycorrhizae. But you know we get this question a lot um, about you know so mycorrhizal fungi are really beneficial, and um, you know we have a blog about it and everything. But then uh, what about the commercial products? And um, I I put a paper out earlier this year. Um, with my old group at Oklahoma State University, we did some research and we actually found a lot of these commercial inoculum um, are not necessarily what they claim. Hmm. They're not necessarily going to be super beneficial. Some of them actually have lots of fertilizer in the inoculum. So you think you're getting mycorrhizae and, you know, there's other research that's been done that shows like there's not much mycorrhizal DNA <laughs> in some of the inoculums that are sold. 
And so, you know, this is why I, I typically caution people. Um, I know that in our thermophilic composting system at Soul Food Web, because there's not a plant growing there to feed um, arbuscular mycorrhizae, that you're not really going to propagate those. There are some techniques that have been developed by the Rodale Institute and other groups to create kind of like an on farm propagation system. So they're growing maybe a few crops uh, in like a berm and they're intentionally growing those crops to increase a local population of mycorrhizal fungi. And, and, and then when they harvest that system, then they can spread those um, spores out into the rest of the farm. But yeah, I don't know if you have found any commercial products that you, I mean, I wouldn't say endorse any here publicly, but if you, when you work with producers, if they're really clamoring for these kinds of commercial products and how you deal with that. I feel like there's so many different aspects of, of my presentation that could have been their own presentation, especially on mycorrhizae, it, just on cultivating mycorrhizae that I could have talked for hours. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I believe, as I mentioned previously, I worked for several different specialty fertilizer companies. And at one of them, we were trying to do a large scale mycorrhizae production so that they wouldn't have to purchase spores and propagules from elsewhere. So it, it, to answer your question, yes, it can be done. Um, how easy is it? How applicable is it? Is it worthwhile? Mm, that's another question. When it comes to assessing mycorrhizal products, and again, remember, I am mainly in the cannabis industry, and there's some overlap between conventional agriculture, commercial agricultural products, and cannabis, but in general, they're quite different. In the specialty fertilizer, hydroponic fertilizer industry, there are a number of different mycorrhizal products. A lot of those materials are ultimately coming from like one place. So the, the, the manufacturers of the product, they're just purchasing spores all from this common source and then mixing it with whatever else. <clears throat> I have looked at a number of these different products under the microscope and have not been overwhelmed with the amount of fungi or fungal propagules that I see. However, with endomycorrhizae, they are obligate mutualists. You need the hosts in order to cultivate them. So, you know, it could just be that in this package, uh, there aren't any currently growing, um, but once you add them to plant roots, they'll begin to grow. That's really giving the the producer the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and I guess ultimately what I'm saying is that a lot of these products that I have looked at have not had much as far as spores or propagules. And when you ask the companies more details about the product, it's kind of, oh, that's proprietary. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know. Um, so in order to cultivate them, you can... Uh, one of the things we did, and like like Adam said at the Rodale Institute, they came out with a great technique for doing this. Also, the book Teeming with Fungi by Jeff Lowenfels talks a lot about mycorrhizae and how we can cultivate it. Um, and essentially what you would do is you would grow like a grass plant. You would inoculate that grass plant with the mycorrhizae that you're trying to cultivate. And then you would plant in the same container where the roots can interact with each other, a number of other grass species that can also become effect infected by this initial mycorrhizal population. So that is kind of how we culture it and store it is to grow it on other plants. And then maybe we are <laughs> sifting that out and trying to dry it and save some of those propagules for the following season. However, I think the best way to use it is to continually be growing a crop in your field and never leave your soil barren. Yeah, thanks for adding um, that idea. Uh, in some grassland restoration work that I did, we collected a tiny amount of soil from perennial native tall grass prairie and then started in little cone containers our nurse plants things you know like warm season grasses and 
we when we transplanted the seedlings in we put a, a little pinch of that native soil so we got not only the mycorrhizae but many of the other microorganisms that are are present quite abundant in there and then it takes like a few weeks for this roots to really get fully colonized by um, those organisms and then we transplanted those um, inoculated plants into the field and it was it was quite an effective method to to get that mycorrhizae back into the soil and there's a little bit of discussion about how much it can crawl per season away from one plant so in an agricultural context i wonder if like every so often we could put in nurse plants or something like that and and have a, a plan to rotate through the field to to bump that up but but then what you're saying is so key too we have to have the right soil and farm management practices to support that population, which means leaving the soil barren, using fungicides, using herbicides, these can all be things that knock that population back down. Tillage, tillage is horrible for um, most fungi, right? <laughs> so yeah, great. Okay, um, I could talk all day about mycorrhizae, but uh, what's too. the best way to get local fungal spores from mushrooms? Uh, and how would you preserve them best? This is from Frederick. Um, the, well, do, do, Adam, do you want to talk about mycorrhizal spores, how they're formed and how you can collect them? Or uh, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with the second part of the question because that's easier to address. Um, so from mushrooms, it's very easy to collect spores. What you would do is you would harvest the mushroom, the fruiting body, whether it's like a typical toadstool with a cap and a stem or if it's more of a brack shaped and it's just like growing like a hoof or so out, out of a tree, what you do is you'd harvest the mushroom, uh, set that with the gill or pore side down, and you'll want to put that, um, I, I think an easy way to do it is just put it on aluminum foil. Um, and then you, I like to cover that just with a, a container, Tupperware, something like that, just to keep in the moisture. And then let that sit for 12, 24 hours, and the mushroom will drop spores out of either the pores or the gills, whichever, um, depending on the mushroom that you have. And then you'll be able to collect what's called a spore print, and spore color, shape, size, all of that can be used as identification features to help identify particular mushrooms. So spores are very resilient um they they can last a long time especially if stored in the refrigerator under ideal conditions um so collecting spores from mushrooms is in my opinion far easier than collecting spores from mycorrhizae and once you collect them it's best to dry it out and then just fold it up and stick it in the refrigerator freezer both work great for storing spores for long terms yeah, and there's obviously a, a number of other saprophytic species that if you like took again maybe just a pinch of soil from a like a a fairly intact ecosystem a forest or a grassland that you could even put that on your compost pile prior to thermophilic um phase and and you know get some of those other um free living environmental organisms it, it's very different like your spore print thing you're trying to really keep it species specific right now one thing kyle i should add here or ask here is i've gotten some people um that are saying i'm not super confident in my mushroom id skills should i be really cautious about like grabbing mushrooms from a field and throwing them in a compost pile what if they're poisonous mushrooms and i i wonder how how you would deal with that question <laughs> i was a little scared <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to give any bad advice. Um, mm -hmm. But just touching a mushroom, that's not that even the most poisonous and deadly mushrooms, of which there are not many, like a handful, maybe I can count out on my fingers. Um, it, touching it is not going to harm you, you have to actually eat it and consume it. And then the toxins that are found within the within the mushrooms get into your body. <clears throat> and that's how they make you sick and ultimately can kill you. Um, as far as grabbing a bunch and throwing them in a compost pile, I think you'd be fine to do that. 
uh, depending on the placement of your pile, I suppose you wouldn't want, if you have any pets or animals, dogs, you wouldn't want them like getting in there and eating any potentially poisonous mushrooms because dogs definitely have eaten uh, toxic mushrooms and they have to get their stomach pumped or, or whatnot. Tom, my advisor, he used to be <clears throat> on the advisory committee, um, in, in the Midwest there. And he would get a number of calls every year about, Oh, my dog was in the yard and it ate this mushroom. Is it going to be sick? What should I do? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, as far as that goes, like, yeah, you can add the, you can collect a bunch and add them into your compost pile. However, do not do that in hopes of growing that particular mushroom because the environment that you found that mushroom in versus the environment in that compost pile are probably going to be very different. And one of the things that I have noticed when trying to inoculate compost piles with fungi, in particular mushroom producing fungi, they don't work well. I think that overall, it can increase the fungal biomass in a compost pile, but it's not the fungus, it's not the mushroom that's growing, it's actually fungal pathogens or things like trichoderma that are actually breaking down that mushroom tissue. That's how you are getting more fungi in the compost, not from actually adding the, the, the mushroom that you put in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does in a lot of ways. Like um, when you're talking about uh, cultivated mushroom species, especially like buying and, you know, uh, oyster mushrooms or something, I've always wondered about, you know, reintroducing those in a more competitor heavy environment because it's like, I mean, you could take a million poodles to the Serengeti, but you, they wouldn't last long if you release them into the Serengeti, right? So, you know, are these things bred to be so, where, where we've kind of made them like a laboratory species more or like specialty kind of, maybe not all of them, but I wonder about that. I, again, all of these things, it's like, oh yeah, I could talk for hours about that. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it depends on the mushroom species. Some some mushrooms seem to, I don't know, play better, work better with a diversity of organisms. Mm -hmm. Others, they kind of like to be by themselves. And if there's one other bacterium or one other microorganism present, the fungus is not going to grow. Um, so, so again, there are a lot of variables. And ultimately, I, I, I think that it, it just depends. Um, I, I do see a lot of compost producers that want to use spent mushroom blocks uh, as an input starter material for their compost in hopes of like, oh, well, I'm adding mushroom blocks. That's going to increase my uh, fungal biomass. Mm -hmm. But not really, because those blocks that particular fungus that was growing on the block is likely not going to be able to exist in the temperatures mm. and the oxygen profiles of our compost piles. So if you want to do that, you certainly can. Um, however, I think the best time to, it, I'll, I'll focus on compost here, the best time to inoculate compost with mushroom producing fungi in hopes of growing mushrooms is after the compost is done composting and has gone through its curing phase is down back at ambient temperatures. Mm -hmm. And to do that, um, not having your compost in one big pile, but in, in smaller wind rows, um, th those are some of the tricks that I have found to increase, uh, our chances, my company's chances of, uh, improving the the fungal biomass in various compost scenarios that makes sense because i think the temperature doesn't actually have to be as hot as we often you know see them getting in thermophilic piles before it can um, be damaging to spores and other things right like so yeah that makes a lot of sense um now just to the part of this question about the the difference with mycorrhizae um I think Kyle did a good job of explaining there's ecto and endomycorrhizae. But just to be clear, ectos, which are often more associated with tree species, they are basidio and ascomycetes for the most part. That's like the group of fungi that are there. And they often form 
mushrooms. I think maybe always, I can't think of one that doesn't. Um, and then endomycorrhizae are actually their own group called glomeromycota. These are the arbuscular mycorrhizas. There's a few other types, but um, it's a very different lifestyle. And so that's why they don't reproduce by making mushrooms. The glomeromycota um, create spores that bud off of their hyphal network in the soil. So when it comes to collecting mycorrhizal spores, I mentioned that like we might go to perennial, especially warm season grass lands and have taken some like, so if you're getting that rhizosphere, even pieces of roots from, from recently growing plants, they're going to have the most potential to have um, mycorrhizal propagules, arbuscular mycorrhizal propagules. If you're trying to increase them, like people grow them in a greenhouse and whatever, they try to make them sporulate, that often involves maybe like letting them get drier because that drying down will signal the mycorrhizae to not just make the vegetative like hyphae, but to actually create spores because it's like the next generation. And if they think the environmental conditions are getting a little harsher or something, then, you know, they will actually say like, okay, we got to quickly reproduce here so that the population doesn't die out. Um, I guess I should probably, you know, provide maybe in the show notes or something that link to the Rodale um, website that's about this because there's an art to it as well um, to, to doing these mycorrhizal on farm propagations. Okay, um, Stephen says, I have access to a lot of cow manure to compost. What are the best bulk ingredients used to create a fungal dominant compost? I also have access to rotten carrots and malt waste. So how do you focus on fungal dominant composts there, Kyle? <clears throat> the, the, there's a number of things that I have done and that I will do. <laughs> my, my answer is going to be, it depends. It depends on where you are, what other resources you have, what other input materials, you know, there, there's a, definitely a good, a good starting place with cow manure and vegetable waste. I mean, you could probably compost most of those materials just by themselves. But I, I do think that um, combining them together, creating your ideal carbon to nitrogen ratios, and then thinking about how you're going to handle and process those materials ultimately can have a, a great impact on the biology that is ultimately present. Um, so uh, I, I have taken compost and isolated out different fungi and then grown them out by themselves and then inoculated those back into the compost after I have had a chance to build up the fungal biomass. That works. And we are able to use the microscope to, to quantify that and to be like, oh, wow, our fungal populations did increase. However, I would not recommend doing that. And I don't think that's the most cost-effective way of increase of producing uh, fungally dominant compost. So what I would do with this, is, I mean, your moisture content is going to be very important. The amount of carbon to nitrogen is going to be very important. And also like uh, how, how you're letting the compost heat up and how many days you're letting it sit for and whatnot. Those are all going to influence your your bi your overall biological community, uh, not just the fungal. If your ultimate goal is to produce this fungally dominant compost, um, so so compost the the biology will go through this succession, right? As in the beginning, we pile the materials together, we turn it, we water it. The temperature is going to climb very quickly, right? And we want that to happen because we want that temperature to kill weed seeds and other potential pathogens but then at a certain point you know the the temperature is going to begin to decrease there'll be more oxygen in the pile um so so what i'm saying is the environment and compost changes and with those changes uh refer to that as the biological succession within compost towards the end of the composting process after it is cooled down is where we start seeing more of these filamentous fungi beginning to grow so my recommendation is to 
do, do your best to stick to what the soil food web recommends as far as carbon to nitrogen ratios, utilizing whatever food sources and input materials that you have. I think it's great if you can use uh, what would otherwise be waste products and then try to just create the best compost possible. That'd be my step one. Then after the compost is produced and it enters into that curing phase, that is when you can add in uh, other and alternate food sources to draw more fungi into this pile. So I think that's the easiest way to incorporate more fungi in your pile. And I'll give a few examples. So you, you pile your compost together, you make it out of cow manure and rotten carrots and malt waste and all these things. You want to make sure that you have good structure, good porosity in your compost. Um, but I would let that sit for a while and climb up in temperature. You'll want to turn it to increase oxygen and decrease that temperature, let it climb up a few times. And then after it has gone through that thermophilic phase where, where it's producing a lot of heat and it begins to reach ambient temperatures, that is when you can add in a secondary food source like um, oats or like sawdust or wood chips to a certain extent. You don't want to uh, restart the composting process, so you don't want the material to start heating up again, but those are all low cost input materials that you can use that will select for fungi. Alternatively, you, you know, once the compost is cured, that would be a good time to add, add in this uh, old growth forest soil or leaf mulch into your compost pile. And in that sense, you are using it as more of an inoculum and less as a food source for, for your composting process. But all of those materials um, likely harbor a bunch of fungi and can definitely be used to make compost, which then, you know, later on, it, you might not need to add any more fungi at all. So, so the best thing you can do really is, is measure these things at the start and at the end and begin to understand how, you know, the different ways that you handle these materials can, how that ultimately affects the biology. Because <clears throat> it really can be contextual and situation dependent. So I'm just trying to give you the most general, broad uh, observations that I have had in my experience working with compost and fungally dominant compost in particular. Uh, well, I think those are some really great ideas that you've mentioned, Kyle. And it, it makes me recall too that um, we have a structure here in our advanced programs where we teach people composting, um, where they get like mentorship on composting that a lot of time, you know they need to make three piles and a lot of people are like i want to make two or three at once and we're like no you're supposed to use the lessons of the first pile to help you change how you do the second pile and also a lot of times um in that process people who get really good at making you know biocomplete composts they're actually making some kind of a tea or something from an old compost pile that was had lots of fungal diversity in it to do that inoculation of a mature compost pile that comes out new. So it's like a way that you can multiply and amplify that bacteria once you've sort of built up your savings account, <laughs> if you will, of fungal biomass through the process. Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> One of the terms that we use is like, we want to create these caches of fungi or of mycelium in on site in different areas so that we have them to use when we need to. It's exciting. That's, that's great stuff. Okay. Please speak to mushrooms as rainmakers, how spores act as nuclei for raindrops and why it is so, why it is that so few of us know about the incredible ecosystem services fungi perform. That's from Carl. Ooh, good, good, good question, Carl. Um, honestly, this is not my area of expertise, so I want to start by saying that. However, it is the, the definitely being in mycology long enough, you know, you hear all sorts of crazy stuff, and I, I think we are barely scratching the surface of the ecosystem services that various fungi perform. 
This is a great example of fungal spores acting as nuclei to form clouds or to form raindrops. I sounds plausible. Um, and I think it's very interesting and I, I, I think makes sense. Um, I know it seems to rain a lot at my house, um, even when it's not raining like a couple streets away. So I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe I have a very high spore load. I hope so. I hope that's the ecosystem service I am supplying to my community. But as far as that goes, I, I mean, I'll, I'll briefly try to describe it. Spores are mi very microscopic. They are quite small. And then perhaps that when, as they are traveling through the air, then um, the, a water droplet is able to form around that spore surface, which then adds enough weight to that water where now gravity pulls it down to the earth. Uh, you know, that, that, that's my vague understanding of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't really speak to it any more than that, um, with any degree of confidence. Well, I mean, I think that, like you said, there's this, there's this rational path that we can take to think about this. And, uh, I have a friend that, um, had, had a project going on Chicago rooftops. to see how many like wind collected mycorrhizal spores. And it was incredible, the diversity of spores, like the seasonality of it, you know, they're just blowing around. And, and then to compare that with like, what do you find in the air species wise versus, you know, what you find in a grassland that's like early to late successional. And it seems like their size of the spore could correlate to some degree to whether it's an early colonizer of a disturbed system you know, versus a larger spore that it needs to be transported by like mice or something <laughs> grabbing onto their fur. And we're, we're starting to really have a bulk of literature around spore dispersal and all of these things. So I I'm gonna have to read more about the rainmaking thing. It could also connect to the way that we do see temperature and moisture changes in like reforestation so we've always focused on like the plants are trans evapotranspiring more water into the air um they're uh intercepting sunlight so that it's not heating up the surface of the soil there's all these ways in which uh they can go through and say like time since a clear cut how have the temperatures changed and how has the moisture changed but then to think about that as a feedback loop too because there are fungi in those systems um yeah it's it's really it, it could be an uh reversing desertification kind of strategy there <laughs> yeah I, I hope so it's kind of surprising to me that uh you know our muscular mycorrhizal spores are spread by wind at all because they are mm -hmm. so they can be so large and it's like well how does that happen then? yeah it it's it's fascinating work i'll i'll share uh, at least one of the papers i know that was published on on that rooftop which was an undergraduate like research project at DePaul University or something. And then they found this wild number of mycorrhizal spores are just flying around in Chicago. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So yeah, I, I have a bunch of papers from stuff that I <clears throat> referenced in my talk. I don't know um, if we can like add that to, to the webpage or whatnot. I also have a number of books and whatnot that, that are great resources for people that want to learn more about mycology and fungi in general. Awesome. Um, I think that maybe we'll see if we can put those in show notes or something on the YouTube yeah, um, posting. So uh, this is an interesting one because it, 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 it lets us go into that whole thing of um, the disease triangle that you brought up. So whether or not by putting wood chips around trees, um, Stephen is creating an environmental situation where something like honey fungus could be there attacking the fruit trees and so um yeah i i don't have much experience myself with orchard plants so i hope that you have some insight here on, on what could potentially be going on i i again my my uh crop that i work with mainly is cannabis which is an annual crop and <laughs> is going to be different than a perennial orchard However, I am very familiar with honey fungus and our malaria species in general. 
I, I think the honey fungus is very cool. Um, it gained a lot of notoriety, I don't know, in the 90s or so, because they found it to be the largest living organism on earth. Um, and the ecology of it, you know, the, this, the, the, sure, the disease triangle, but also it's important to remember that this is all on a spectrum and that fungi do not fit in these little boxes that we like. And we like to think that fu honey fungus is bad unless we're collecting the mushrooms and then it's like, oh, it's good. Um, but no, what I am saying is that in certain parts of the tree's life, the honey fungus could actually be giving some benefits to the trees. Then once the environmental conditions are correct, maybe the fungus runs out of food and then begins to kill that tree so that it has additional food. Now, any good pathogen or parasite never wants to kill its host completely because then it is going to have to find alternative food sources. So from an evolutionary standpoint, it is best just to slowly kill your host, right? And just a little bit at a time. So then you have more of a consistent long-term food source. I would say that there are a number of variables that could influence this um, as far as uh, a shovel scoop or two of wood chips around the base of the tree, I would not be overly concerned about, you know, bringing in honey fungus and trying to get that there and that the wood chips may contain honey fungus that would then uh, infect the tree. It depends on the type of wood chips that you are using, where they are coming from, how long they've been stored, all of these things. But in general, the, the way I think about it is you're you're doing something good. You are mulching essentially your, your tree with wood chips. And that is going to enhance the overall biological diversity that is in the rhizosphere of your trees. And if you are able to create more of a robust biological community in that root system, then chances are that it that the tree is going to become less susceptible to pathogen attack. Uh, honey fungus kind of gets a bad rap because it like destroys a lot of trees. But my question is, is that always a bad thing? Um, you know, it, it, it's just a change of perspective, I suppose. So it could be looked at as really, this is another ecosystem service that the honey fungus is playing by weeding out uh, you know, runty type plants. So plants that are not growing as well, or maybe sick individuals from, from a forest, well, this fungus is attacking it so that those, that sick individual is not able to produce its offspring that can then go into the environment. So in that way, the, the fungus is kind of helping with natural selection and ensuring that only the top performing genetics are able to be spread to the subsequent generations. I really like that uh, ecological perspective that you're bringing, Kyle. It, it reminds me of some work that's been done in the last couple of decades in the tall grass prairie because in the central US, in, in you know, places like Illinois, Oklahoma, Kansas, you can, uh, in a meter square, just randomly thrown down, you're like, there's 16 plant species here. It's incredible diversity in the plant community. And then, and then you ask why. And we start to pack these things together and we say like, well, mycorrhizal fungi are really active and they're helping some plants more than others as a mutualist but then pathogenic fungi are in there and they're also pruning back the dominance of certain plants. And so it's like that coexistence that happens when it's just those, those competing relationships and cooperative relationships. It's like nature is so complex, we can't understand it. But so looking at it through a singular lens, like I, I don't really like the lens of saying, oh, honey fungus is bad. It's you know, okay, so let me go back with our fruit tree. I keep going back to like dog breeding. Hmm. You know, I, I have this adorable dog and she has a, a, a breed uh, that's a big part of her genetic makeup that's pretty prone to certain kinds of cancer. And so I'm like, well, we got these things that we wanted, 
like certain physical traits or personality traits or whatever. And then along with that came these things that um, can reduce fitness or longevity or whatever. Fruit trees are hugely like that, where we've like bred them for these specific things and we're trying to get the most apples or whatever to grow on them. And they don't necessarily have as robust an immune system. And so it's like finding that middle ground where there's in the ecological, we always talk about like collaborating with nature and stuff and, and wanting these systems to be more natural. It's living with that tension that there's like, we want to harvest a lot of apples. So we don't want honey fungus like ripping through, you know, having like this negative impact on our livelihood or whatever. And yet that makes me go, are there different questions should we be asking about how we're breeding plants, um, mm -hmm. about other things in the, in the environment? Because the idea of stomping out the pathogen, it seems completely impossible to me in the environment you're not you're you're never going to be just like the pathogens are all gone and we never have to worry about them anymore you can create a context under which they're very likely to be out competed before they're a problem i mean that's my perspective on it anyway i don't know if you agree with that <laughs> yeah no i i think that was you know beautifully said and um yeah, that, that's why I think that just creating more awareness about fungi and the different roles that they play and just we, we are able to appreciate them in different ways and just be like, oh, wait, I was kind of just trying to like get rid of this thing, but maybe mm -hmm. I need to try to work with the biology and ally with these different microbial communities to help grow the best plants opposed to just trying to eliminate anything. And I, again, that teaches me about myself and my own like uh, control issues that I have in different relationships and whatnot. And it's like, why am I trying? I didn't even realize I was doing that. But the the, the fungi were kind of able to, to help teach me that lesson, I suppose, on a more grand scale. And that's what I hope to impart onto others in the audience that is listening here is just like that there's um, from more of an abstract perspective, there are so many lessons that, that these fungi can teach us. And um, yeah, no, I, I think it's great. Nature is complex and yeah, every it, it seems like everything is interconnected. So ju just having awareness around that, I think is a great starting point. Hugely, yeah. Okay, I think this will be our last chance to sort of, um, before we get to the two o'clock, well, two o'clock my time, I guess it's, we're, we got people from all over the world, before we get to the top of the hour, and we're, we're finished. So um, this is great, because I think this fits right with what we're saying. Uh, this uh, Bill is, is referencing Dee Dee Pursehouse's um, uh, workshop that we offer here through the Soul Food Web. She was also on a webinar with us a couple months ago called Hope from the Biosphere. And um, she mentioned saprophytic fungi. Dee brings in that whole framework that we're talking about of like, we can either approach nature with the sterilize it if we don't like it approach, or we can come in with this kind of coexist and partner and collaborate sort of approach. So I highly recommend her soul workshop. But they're asking how saprophytic fungi relate to mycorrhizal fungi. And so um, I'll just go ahead and, and cut this one off at the pass. So I mentioned that there's ectos and endos. Endomycorrhizae, the arbuscular mycorrhizae, we don't think they have any saprophytic capacity. It, it, as far as I know, nobody has ever shown that very well. Uh, they need the plant. The plant is their source of carbon. Because Ectomycorrhizae are basidiomycetes and ascomycetes. They have a lot of the mechanisms to absorb carbon through a decomposition pathway as well. I think that if they went for enough time without a partner tree, they either might go dormant or they may go into that saprophytic lifestyle, but it seems that they almost always prefer to link up with the tree as opposed to just being saprophytes so and you define saprophytes earlier um very well so yeah what are your thoughts about um 
saprophytic fungi in general <laughs> or, or if there's anything I missed. I, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I, I, I guess to start with, it's just like uh, the field of mycology, one of the things that drew me into it is like there's a lot of information that isn't known and that we just mm -hmm. don't understand currently. So the reason why I bring that up is because we're uh, mycorrhizae fungi. Yeah, maybe we've known about for 50 years. I, I don't know how long, but it's really become hot in science the past 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even this, I think it was this year that the mucor mycotina was found. So there's this mm -hmm. new type of mycorrhizae that does kind of run the gamut of it can be saprophytic, but it also seems to preferentially prefer the, this mycorrhizal association. Mm -hmm. And those are termed fine root endophytes. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I could try to explain my current understanding of it, but I don't think my current understanding is complete. And, and the, the, another perfect lesson from mycology is I, I have to be okay with not knowing everything because there are just some things that, uh, you know, we do our best, but it is what it is. So to answer your question, mycorrhizal fungi, I, I think Adam answered it well, where um, especially our muscular mycorrhizae, they are not really going to be having more of that saprophytic lifestyle where they're breaking down organic material primarily, if not always, almost always, they are growing in association with that root and they are difficult to uh, cultivate separately. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure some types of mycorrhizae can grow in saprophytic ways where they are breaking down dead organic material and not solely relying on that host for its nutrients. But that is not the case with all of them. Again, there are so many different types of mycorrhizal associations. I, I, I was in school eight, eight, eight years ago, um, and I learned about five different types of mycorrhizae. Now there are like over 10 different types. Um, mm -hmm. the, so the, my point being, it's likely to change, but yeah, sure. So some of them can grow saprophytically, um, but not all of them. Yeah. And I really like that you brought up again, that, that complexity and how much we don't know, because um, you might've noticed, like you can replay the tape as my proof that I like started to be more definitive with my answer. And then I was like, oh, well, I don't think anybody's ever shown that. Right. And that's like, that's me retreating into the, I've been at this for 15 years and I guess maybe I know about 1% of the soil story at this point. Like if I'm lucky, I know 1%. That's not to discourage anybody. It's just, we can get to a point of practical application a lot faster than we can get to a point of saying we've got it figured out. Right. And, and, all of the thousands of research papers that go into various, you know, mycology topics every year, uh, I still, I read them often and I go, well, is that just going to happen in a greenhouse? <laughs> like, well, is that okay? What about this other factor, you know, that, that wasn't controlled for? Sometimes I, I read a whole paper on mycorrhizae and it's about like, grown in corn in a field and here's the difference and i'm like they didn't even tell me the history of this field i don't know if it's been tilled up a lot i don't know if it's been herbicided a lot how do i have an understanding of the baseline of the soil food web in this field because you know it's like it's just not reported <laughs> i could totally relate adam and i think it's good <laughs> as a scientist to be skeptical however i think it, it's also good to have awareness around that skepticism and like okay i've been trained at a science as a scientist meaning that i i view the world through these certain lenses and that has restrictions you know as we had talked about previously so um yeah i think knowing that we are still learning about these things mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to use it uh, to apply it in our particular situation. So um, I think we've got a lot to learn. I think that now is an exciting time to get into fungi and be interested in mycology. Yeah. And actually, I uh, we're, we're going to close down here. So I say all that about the complexity of things. 
not to discourage any of us, but to say there's we're much more on level playing ground. Like if you if if somebody's got a PhD in this stuff and somebody's a farmer, I'm like they both have an important lens to bring to the table, right? And so we're all we're peering into something that is so mysterious and there's a lot of competing ideas about how these things are defined or tied together or what practices or whatever. And as a community, we're co-creating the knowledge together. So everybody has a place at the table. Yeah, I, again, that, that was really well said. And yeah, I, yeah, I encourage everybody to try to learn more because like you said, they each, everybody brings a unique perspective and that's how we can truly learn and try to figure out some of what is going on. And also it's a, a bit of a humility for us too, just being like, hey, we don't know everything. We're, we're doing our best, but it'll come with time. Awesome. Well, with that, I think we're going to end our time together today. It went too fast, Kyle. I really appreciate you spending a little over two hours with us and, and for everybody for attending. Yeah, thank you for having me. Again, I feel like, uh, I, you know, I have so many more topics I want to just talk with you about and be like, well, what do you think about this? And that, you know, that there's so much new research coming out. So it's really great. Awesome. And I want to draw everybody's attention and give thanks to our IT team and our support um, crew who have been um, gathering the questions together. And I know that there's um, going to be ways through um, the YouTube posting and all for, for you to reach out and, and connect with us more um, at the school. But thanks, everybody, for attending. Yep. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.